Well, today I'm very excited to be speaking with Molly Lewis. She's faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. She has been using her training in linguistics research to shed light on some interesting questions related to intergroup behavior. So thank you very much for being here, Molly. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. All right, so I like to start all of these by just asking people, what are the research questions that most guide your work? Yeah, so I'm a sort of developmental psychologist by training, um, and I'm interested um, in language and meaning. Um, and so the sort of questions that I've sort of converged on as being sort of the focus of my research is trying to understand how um, language um, word meanings are learned, um, but it's sort of how those processes change at different time scales of analysis. So you can think of sort of one really short time scale as being like the time scale of a conversation and a longer time scale being the time scale of like language acquisition. Um, and then a much longer time scale being language evolution. So many, many years over which um, languages change. Um, and you can also think about scales at the level of um, the relationship between the individual um, and the group. And um, this is obviously really related to questions about language evolution. Um, so those are sort of the space that I sort of think about um, in the context of um, language and words and meaning. So you have a background in linguistics, and but you've really been publishing some very interesting work lately that is very interesting to social psychologists in particular. So I imagine you know, linguistics is a fascinating field, of course, but there's a lot of questions there that aren't necessarily about social psychology processes. So could you tell us a little bit about how you developed this interest specifically? Yeah, so as I said, my sort of, um, or my undergraduate training was in linguistics and sort of formal linguistics. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed formal linguistics. It's like kind of a fun math logic sort of thing. Um, but the stuff about language that I find really exciting um, is sort of language and its social context. Mm -hmm. um, and that has actually been, you know, not studied very much um, in the psychology domain. So people have thought a lot about um, sort of um, language from a sort of extreme cognitive perspective where um, language exists in the mind of a speaker, of a single speaker in a black, black box, and we're just sort of trying to figure out how that works. Um, but what I really like about language, and I think really sort of gives it its complexity, um, is that it exists in its social context. And so people are starting to sort of apply theories and um, questions that have been asked in sociolinguistics and anthropology um, to um, language in the domain of psychology. Right, so we went over your paper in class and I'm sure I did my best, but at the end of the day, I'm still pretty novel to these types of analyses. So for a very interested but non-expert audience, could you kind of give us the bird's eye view of what it is actually you're doing to use text to derive some sort of measure of implicit associations about stereotypes? Yeah, so, um, so the sort of core idea is that you can get information, um, you can sort of get semantic meaning information from language um, by looking at really low level co-occurrence statistics in the language. So just what words co-occur with what other words. Um, so take, for example, um, the words man and doctor. Um, if you look at sort of a large corpus of text, those words tend to co-occur with each other. And furthermore, um, the neighbors of those words tend to be similar to each other um, in a large corpus of text. Um, this idea is pretty old, I mean, relatively old. So um, cognitive psychologists um, came up with sort of formal models of this idea in the 1990s. Um, and I mean, the, so the core idea is even older than that. Um, but since then, machine learning folks have really taken this idea and developed really sophisticated models that allow us to really apply it um, to larger scale corpora um, and um, sort of get more accurate representations of meaning from these co-occurrence statistics. So this is, this is a distributional semantics, that's the kind of the terminology you're using? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you're looking and, at the distribution of word co-occurrences across a corpus of text. And you're using that to develop some sort of degree to which words related to gender are words related to career versus family, and using that co-occurrence to estimate the strength of that stereotype. Exactly, yeah. And so what these models give you, sort of practically, is they give you a vector, a numerical vector that represents each word. 
Um, it's like a 100 dimensional vector. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can compare words like man and doctor by comparing their vectors um, by taking their cosine, the cosine distance between two vectors. And the idea is that um, vectors that have a um, higher cosine distance um, are more, or cosine similarity are more similar to each other um, relative to ones that have a lower cosine measure. And so what you did in your paper is that you correlated those vectors, the distance in those vectors, uh, with estimates of IIT scores for a certain country, right? Yep. Based on the language right. spoken in that country predominantly, yes. Yep. Um, yeah. So in your paper, you're very careful about, you know, this is a very impressive correlational analysis. You're very careful about, you know, does language create these biases or does language reflect these biases? But for the sake of this interview, I'm going to ask you to speculate, you know, if you had to predict whether one is more likely than the other, or you think that they're kind of mutually reinforcing, what do you really think is the, ca the, the causal direction here? Yeah, so th this is a question that yeah, I care a lot about, and we were sort of careful in the paper about how we talked about it, because we really don't have the data, as you said, to make strong claims. Um, so I think there's you know, almost uh, certainly a causal arrow from um, concepts or cognitive representations to distributional statistics because people are the the ones sort of creating these distributional producing this language mm -hmm. um, i think the, the more interesting question as you say is whether there's also a causal arrow um, from language um, to stereotypes and cognitive representations um, and i think i i think there's very likely to be i think the question is how strong um, is that um, sort of causal effect mm -hmm. um, and given that there is I think there's like a lot of wide open space of sort of questions you can ask about um, the sort of nuances of how that effect plays out. Yeah so one thing I was interested in in your paper and correct me if I'm wrong is that you use two, di two different sets of text you use uh, Wikipedia and then you use media subtitles and it seemed like the analysis the results were largely similar for the two of those is that right? That's right. Yeah. I find that surprising to be honest because you would think that you know, media, we know that certain groups are disproportionately more likely to be depicted as villains, for example. We know that it's not really an accurate, accurate representation of reality, what you see in the media. Now, maybe I'm giving Wikipedia too much credit here, but it seems like at least when people are writing on it, they could be taking a more objective stance. But it seemed mm -hmm. like the biases were reflected similarly in both of those texts. Were you surprised by that? And what do you make of it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was surprised. I mean, it's a pretty heterogeneous, both of them are pretty heterogeneous corpora, and, and it's sort of hard to know what's going on. Um, but yeah, I think a priori, I would have made the same prediction that you made, that it would be um, larger in the subtitle corpus um, than the Wikipedia corpus. Um, I have some other work looking at um, doing sort of similar analyses in kid, kid book text. Mm -hmm. um, like children's picture books, like Good Night Moon. Um, and there we find, um, sadly, that the effects are actually bigger um, than in Wikipedia. So these stereotypes seem to be sort of exaggerated in um, input to kids. Okay, so we can definitely go over that paper too now that we've done the work to go over the first paper. So now since you brought it up, so what's your explanation for the, the reason why these biases seem to be even stronger in kids' book text? I don't know. I mean, sort of one, I don't, it's, it's certainly alarming. I mean, I think, um, and it's alarming in part because when you look at many of these books, it's not obvious to you that this is like a really sort of biased, biased book. Um, it's, it's sort of like um, kids, you're sort of, what, what we're transmitting to kids is sort of a super stimulus. It's sort of an exaggerated version um, of these stereotypes. Um, and I suspect, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good explanation for why that is. And maybe if we're, we're giving them a simplified world as their first introduction to these social structures, when we're paring that down, we're losing a lot of nuance and only reading. Right, right. The sort of goal is pedagogical in that yeah. case. Hmm. Kind of, Very kind of, interesting. Yeah. Um, so these analyses seem like they require a great deal of text to run. Uh, but in the future, do you think it's possible, or maybe there's work on right now, of looking at within the text that one specific person makes? So it could be like a historical figure, like Shakespeare, I don't know. But also over time with a diary study to have people just kind of write repeatedly over time. Do you think this is an application? Yeah, so yeah, you're right. So sort of a limitation of this method is you need a lot of text, but there are sort of newer methods coming out 
of um, machine learning research that allow you to use um, much smaller corpora um, to do similar analyses. And so, well, yeah, one thing I'd be really excited to do is sort of look longitudinally um, at like an input to a child um, to mm. think about how, how this changes over development. You know, I, there's no way of confirming this, but with the rise of things like Alexa, the chances are that's right. recording a lot of text and maybe that could be used for some nefarious purposes, obviously, but at the same time, the presence of these speakers in someone's home could also be used for less uh, nefarious and more interesting research purposes as well. So do you think that maybe over time we could even start to use things like that? For sure. I mean, so we, yeah, linguistic input of any, of any kind, um, can, you know, can be used with these models. Um, and my intuition, at least, is sort of more spontaneous um, uh, spoken speech is likely to have um, more bias in it than, um, than written text. And what people, well, yeah, will write on Wikipedia. Very interesting. Um, so do you have any other, I mean, jumping off of that, do you have any current uses of this method that you're finding particularly novel or insightful or are really excited about? Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, I, the direction I'm excited about going is um, sort of more experimental methods mm. um, using sort of sort of the, the idea that you were suggesting, um, like trying to train on um, smaller corpora. Um, because for me, the sort of exciting question is about causality, and it's really hard to get at causality um, doing these sort of correlational studies. Um, and so I'm excited about possibilities where you sort of manipulate people's language statistics at mm. a sort of longer time scale um, and in maybe some domain that's, you know, ethically okay to manipulate. Yeah, I guess jump, jumping off of that, maybe, you know, imagine a world where you didn't have any ethics or we didn't have any ethical oversight. Like, what would be your ideal study that you could run? Yeah, um, I, let's see, I don't know, I guess, um, like randomly assigning kids to schools with totally different like curriculum or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's that's more thoroughly reviewed for the presence of stereotypes in text yeah. and one where it's like even maybe even ramped up. Yeah, and like train yeah and training uh -huh. yeah so you could yeah yeah maybe ramping I guess ramping up the stereotypes and then training on like all the linguistic input from teachers um, and everything you need okay. maybe their peers. Um, and so. This is your, this is the last one of these. Um, this is for the last class. It's all about future directions, and so of course we're going to talk about future directions being particularly interdisciplinary. I mean that's obviously where all these things end. And you seem like someone who's done a lot of work in that sense of trying to use methods developed from one discipline and applying the, them to questions in another one. The limited times I've tried to do this, I've found it extremely difficult uh, and very frustrating uh, almost because. When any time you do this work, you have to bridge what's valued in one discipline versus another, or who has different priorities or different conventions. And so as you're talking to the future researchers of tomorrow, do you have any advice for how to really cultivate and make important interdisciplinary contributions? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, um, let's see. Um, I think, um, I think you know the, the you are, like when you do interdisciplinary research, you really have to sort of abstract away from um, a lot of the sort of nitty gritty debates in a particular field um, mm -hmm. in order to sort of make some useful contribution. Um, and I think sort of being willing to not um, to sort of appreciate the theoretical debates um, in a particular field, um, but being willing to sort of not throw out the baby with the bathwater and take what's useful um, and being able to apply it to your own work. So I think, in, so, uh, you know, in, in this particular paper, a case of that is the IAT, um, which is sort of like an amazing um, data source for us for this purpose. Um, but there's, you know, lots of qualms you could have about the extent to which this is measuring different aspects about, um, you, know, this is, you know, in an ideal world, you'd like to have lots of other measure, behavioral measures of um, social biases. Um, and so I think um, so being able to take um, what's useful for your purposes um, and apply it to a different domain right. is an important skill. Not to get too stuck down in the, in the important, but ultimately kind of narrow 
just methodological theoretical discussions within one any one field and have the ability to kind of abstract. Right, right, right. Okay, very important. Um, all right, so I'd like to end on this question. So, you know, what are the questions or the ideas in intergroup relations research that you would want to see us make the most progress on in the next five to 10 years? What are the real things that you want to see addressed? Um, let's see, I guess two come to mind. So one I've talked about a fair bit is this causality question, is really understanding, pinning down the role that language is playing um, and um, sort of, I think there's a sort of lot of open-ended questions around in that space, like does the source of the text matter? Um, like do you um, sort of make stronger inferences depending on where you're hearing this? Um, is it a low hearing linguistic input from, um, is it a low level mechanism? Like do you just, does it need to be ambient? Um, or do you need to be sort of like processing it? Um, just to sort of name a few. Um, the other sort of really exciting direction I think is using the methods that I describe in my paper are sort of similar methods to, to um, measure stereotypes and text in a more bottom up way. Um, so in my work, I'm taking a particular stereotype that's very well studied um, in the sort of um, you know, behavioral psych literature um, and you know, measuring it in this text. But it would be really exciting, I think, if you could sort of figure out um, what stereotypes um, were in this text um, without sort of, um, sort of in an unsupervised way. Um, well, so that's very, yeah, that's very interesting. We might be presented with stereotypes that we think are not that prevalent or not that impactful, but really what the text is telling us is that people are encountering them over and over again. Right, right, right. Well, okay. Well, you'll have to come back in 10 years and tell us what we found. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Molly Lewis. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you.